Hi, I'm Bobby Castro. And I'm Sophia Castro. And, and we're, we're the, the Passionate, passionate Few. Few. You know, in this interview with Omar, um, you're gonna get a lot of value. You're gonna actually see how we were able to start a business with absolutely no money. We sold the business for $1 billion valuation. And during the same time, we were building a real estate portfolio of over $300 million. This interview has so much value. Pay attention to it, tune in it. More so, share it with others, man, because sharing is simply caring. Yeah, and I'm so glad that I was able to be in this interview to be able to give you the knowledge that we have on relationship, on being entrepreneurs, and how we were able to get through this from zero all the way down to, a, um, all the way up to an, a billion dollar evaluation company. Uh, thank you so much, Omar, for inviting us on your podcast. Really enjoyed it. And then three years later, Sophie and I exited for a billion dollars, our last 17%. It was $170 million, all cash. All three were all cash. Uh, no, no hold back, yeah, no, no, uh, res- no you know, none of that stuff. Holy shit, all cash. The power, <laughs> I get so freaking pumped. <laughs> the power of information. Hey guys, welcome to this very special episode of The Passionate Few. Today we have on a power couple, none other than Bobby Castro and Sophia Castro, to share their amazing story of going from rags to riches, but more importantly, sharing the insights on how they built a successful relationship and how they've literally gone from rock bottom, literally humble beginnings, to not only build a company to a billion dollar valuation, but have over $300 million in real estate assets that are cash flowing. And uh, today we're gonna share their story. So thank you guys so much for being on the show today, Bobby and Sophia. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for having us here in your guys' uh, beautiful abode here in the Hollywood Hills. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys, first and foremost, you know, you guys have been married, what, almost 30 years now? Yep. So talk to me a little bit about your guys, where you guys grew up, and uh, how you guys first met early on. Well, I was born in the Bronx, New York, and um, my mom had me when she was 27. My dad was 50, had about 11, 12 kids at the time, uh, and we migrated to Miami. So I was pretty much raised in Miami. Uh, all my life, uh, a, a beautiful mother. Um, she's here today with me. She just turned 80 years old. And my mom was a waitress her entire life, practically her entire life. Um, before Denny's, I, I, right now it's called Denny's and we all know what Denny's is. Right. It's a place where you go. And most of the time you go at 5 a.m., maybe after a wedding or maybe yeah. a party. And that beautiful waitress who waits on you, man, yeah. that's my mom. Wow. So she did that gig. It's called the graveyard shift. When she got done with that, she walked home because there was no car to drive home. Wow. And we lived close to the restaurant she worked at. So my mom walked home uh, about three, four hours later, start preparing for her second gig at another restaurant. And my mom uh, lived on the couch. Uh, wow. All as far as I can remember. And then when she was done with that second gig, she went home rest up for about two, three hours, went again to another gig, the third gig at the Roni Pub Steakhouse in Miami Beach. She had two full-time jobs and a part-time? Three. Three full-time jobs. Three, waiting on tables, providing for her three boys. And uh, my my dad, um, amazing, he passed away when he was 94 years old, Omar, about maybe seven years ago or so. Very passive, a a, a huge introvert, um, you know, wasn't really... um, as motivated as maybe myself. So they stayed but together. Beautiful, they stayed together really for uh, myself, Eric, and Kevin. For the kids. Uh, yeah. My dad lived in one room, my mom lived on the couch. And, but they did a beautiful job with us and um, I think they stayed together because of us. And I, I see my mom struggle. Practically, you know, my, until May, all the way through, man. And um, I didn't enjoy that struggle at all. It actually bothered me um, and I left school after the ninth grade. I failed at the third grade because I wasn't good in comprehension, um, and I'm still not. So sometimes when someone asks me a question, I have to repeat the question or <laughs> modify the question to make sure I understand the question. Yeah. So they thought I was a difficult child. Uh, I wasn't, I, I, I behaved well, and I said, Mom, I wanna leave school. So that's when I left school at the ninth grade, and back then it was junior high. She let you? Just not like high that. school, yeah, dude, no, no pushback. It's like my mom knew something that I didn't know. Yeah. And she maybe have figured out this is our way out. I don't know. Um, and it gets a little crazier in the story too, but practically I grew up in Miami. How Same thing you? with Sophie. Yeah, I was, um, I was born and raised in uh, Miami also. My parents are Cuban. They came from Cuba back in 1959 and 
I was born in Miami, though. Um, we were both raised in the same city. Wow. <laughs> and we didn't even know each other. <laughs> um, and we ended up, I come from a very low on family, too. My father worked three jobs. My mom didn't work because she was, we had five kids in the house. So it, it was not affordable for her to go to work to go pay for somebody to take care of us. So wow. she was a stay-at-home mom. And, and, and real um, quick, Bobby, I know you had 15 siblings, right? Yeah, yeah. So my dad had uh, many children be before he met my mom. Yeah. My mom was 27, my dad was 50. He was definitely a player. He loved the ladies, <laughs> the ladies loved him. And there was a lot of personalities growing up like that. A lot of passion, I call it, a lot of chaos. So you guys um, both grew up in a lot of that. Yes, sort of yes, a lot. yes. Um, Very same background type of thing. And um, yeah. so when I, I also dropped out in the 10th grade though, um, before the, you guys knew each other. Before we knew yeah. each other. We, we oh, went wow. to the same schools, yeah. but like he's four years older than me. We never really ran into each other, but we knew the same friends, a yeah, group yeah. of friends, but wow. we never knew each other at all. Was and, it, um, it semi-common to drop out in that area? Not, I don't know. Um, you know, that's I a great I, question, Omar. I'm going to say maybe it was yeah. because, you know, we, we lived in an area that maybe didn't have much opportunity, opportunity or we were yeah. exposed to opportunity. So I don't know, great question. I would think the yeah. stats are pretty high. I know my friends not my friends finished school, so I, I'm not sure that it was. I, I don't like, know I what I could it imagine was. a first date where you guys are like, hey, I dropped out in ninth grade. Yeah. I dropped out yeah, in 10th grade. grade, yeah. It you know, was. we never even really talked about we, it. Yeah. I, because I guess maybe it was common because it was it's never. Slowed, yeah, yeah I, don't I don't know. I, but, uh, you know, I had dyslexia um, and didn't know it. I didn't find out that I was dyslexic until I was my mom that I was teaching my daughter how to do homework wow. and I noticed that I was writing my numbers inverted and so forth and I used to love math at school and I couldn't pass this that grade I kept on failing and failing and I was like you know what I need to go to work I wanted to buy a car and my parents couldn't afford to get me a car because they didn't have money they had five kids and you know so I just said you know what I'm gonna go work and go get my own car yeah. and I, I used to I still do I'm a I love clothes I'm like a freak of shoes and clothes and <laughs> I wanted to buy things that she couldn't afford and um, so I went to work and she also didn't my parents didn't give me no pushback also they just told me if you're dropping out you're going straight to work and I said yes what I want to do I want to go buy my own stuff and um, so we did and we met when I was 18 years old Bobby was 22 in Miami um, on a real famous road that's called Lejeune, Lejeune road, road which is a Hialeah. it's a road that you need to get through it's a main artery do you guys remember the first time ever yes you guys communicated what happened yes um, well, I'll say my story <laughs> yeah everybody um, has a different version yeah. of it yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I was a stud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah, working was. <laughs> um, I was working uh, on the phones selling timeshares to folks outside the country that was interested in selling their timeshares. So one of her friends were working there. She was a secretary. So one day I was running super late for work. It was a night shift. So we would, you know, I, I worked, I did a deal or a gig in the day. At night I would work at the sales center. So I was running. I parked. I was running, uh, running uh, to work. I was running super late. And I heard a bunch of beeping the horns. And I just ignored it. So I ran in. And then our friend comes in. Hey, I want you to meet my friend. I said, I have no time. I just got here, man. I'm going to get fired. I mean, yeah. leave me alone. So I went out ran to the driver's side and uh the girl there says wrong chick man you gotta go on the other side she's on the passenger <laughs> side so i ran on the passenger side and i'll never forget yeah. sophie had this bleached hair you know a beautiful Curly. just and, and i'll never forget she, the biggest smile and that was the first time we met and um then two weeks later we 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 went out for a date but uh that was awesome. She Did was you in ask her mom's date. Uh, on that no, not right there. We were supposed to meet uh, at a place that everyone goes in the Grove, Coconut Grove, but we never connected made it happen, or whatever. Connected. Yeah. And then, so you asked her out when you did get a chance. So we, two weeks later, and we went to the beach, Miami Beach. I asked her out, and I brought in a bottle. I brought a bottle of wine, two yeah. glasses, <laughs> and you You're take prepared, you, huh? you, you take someone you to the beach. Fun. You know, the, the, what is the intent here? Yeah, yeah. But it was all good intention. So we go to the beach. Pour the wine, um, and I asked her during the conversations, can I give you a pop kiss? <laughs> and she looked at me, and she said, yeah, give me a pop kiss. <laughs> and I gave her a pop kiss, and that was the end of that. We conversated, and I didn't know she had a curfew, Omar. Yeah. She never told me. Yeah. She had strict parents. So we wind up getting back at her house at, at, Super at midnight. Super late, two hours later. She's running curfew. out, and I thought that maybe, <laughs> wow, man, I, I must be a big, bad, terrible turn on because she's <laughs> running out of the car. Yeah. 
So when she's running out, I hold her just softly. I said, you're going to be the mother of my children. I'm going to marry you. <laughs> she looked at me like saying, just, she ran even faster. Yeah, I ran faster. <laughs> that was the first date. Yeah, yeah. That, that was, was our first, first date. date. Wow. Yeah, and I thought he was crazy. And I called my friend that day and I was like, who did you introduce me to? Even though that I was the one that asked yeah. to get, you know, to introduce. Because when I saw him walking in, I had asked my friend, I'm like, oh my God, who's that guy? Yeah. And so she told me that's uh, Eric's brother because I knew his brother's girlfriend really well, which she was in the car with me. Yeah. And um, they said, that's Eric's brother. And I'm like, damn, can you guys introduce me before? But he had had a girlfriend for five years. Oh, wow. And um, and he was a player, by the way. He had a girlfriend and he was a major player. So like they were like, like, yeah, son, yeah, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, you know, that, back then. I learned yes. from my mistakes. Yeah. So. <laughs> and um, so... When he came to the car, we got introduced, like he said, and then that day that he took me to the beach, I thought, oh, he's coming with a bottle of wine and he's taking me to the beach, another Hialeah guy, because all the guys in Hialeah are Cuban and they're like the same. They're like, want to get in your pants right away? And, yeah. you know, so I'm like, oh God, here I go, another one. Another so, bottle of wine. Another <laughs> bottle. So I'm like, okay. Um, but he was super, like, you know, proper, asked me to kiss. And I'm like, I have never been asked, <laughs> can I give you a kiss? A and I was kiss. laughing. What's a pop kiss? Just uh, like on the, on the oh, lips, just, quit, just yeah, like, yeah, a, yeah. you know, yeah, I was like, okay. Um, so when I got dropped off and he did that to me, I was like, oh my God, this guy's crazy. I mean, yeah. like, he, this is really weird. So I called my friend and I told her, and I'm like, I don't know what you did, but this guy is really crazy. So, you know, I ignored it and we were laughing about it. And um, the day after he called me again to see if I wanted to hang out, just not to go out, just to hang out. And we did, and ever since that day, We've been together been hanging out. <laughs> since that day that we went on wow. the first date. Yeah. And then talk to me a little bit about that time. Did you have the premonition to want to build a big company, want to build a big business where you hustling multiple yeah. jobs? So, like, so what were some jobs that you sort of all laid the hospitality, foundation? Omar, like my mom, my mom. And we, we used to iron Eric and I, her apron, all those three jobs, those shifts. So we knew the deal about hospitality. And in hospitality, if you really want to maximize the opportunity, you got to have good people skills because my mother was fighting for that 18% tip and the only way she'll get that 18% tip, good experience, good service, giving good value. So we knew how important it was because we grew up on Rent-A-Center. Rent-A-Center means this, if you don't have enough money to buy a bed, a coffee table, a couch, a lamp. and you have bad credit, that was all us. You rented by the week. And it was, I'll never forget this, and it bothered me because every time Every week it seemed like they were picking up furniture. And then my mom would struggle, write post-dated checks, and they told her, stop the post-dated checks. It doesn't work no more. Wow. Either give me a money order or don't call us back. They were picking it up, redelivering it constantly that in a, in a very consistent manner because my mom was struggling, man. And your dad wasn't providing? My dad was, he's so beautiful, he was passive. You know, my, my dad, um, and I think that's where I get some of my, my kindness from is, is my father. My father had me when he was 50 and at 62 years old, that means I was 12 years old, my dad decided to retire. Because back then you can get your first cash in if you decide to retire at 62 years old. So my dad retired and didn't get a job even after that, he just retired. And he's, he was retired ever since, but we were struggling financially. So I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. Yeah. And mom's working three, four times. Yeah. 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 And my mom, the uh, I, I do get the, 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 the personality and this, this, this hyperness from my mother. And when you meet my mom, you'll, you'll see it instantly. So I started being that bus boy at 14 years old. I'll never forget that. I was so excited. My mom bought me the white shirt, button down was everything. We can barely afford it. It was at Kmart. We went to pay less. We got the shoes. I was so excited to this moment. That's still my wow moment. I was the best takeout person and I was I was obsessed to being a busboy because back then you had to be 16 years old to get a job. If, if not, it's, it was illegal back then. But Pasquale, the owner of Pasquale's, it was an Italian restaurant, he did my mom a favor. So I, I worked my way up to a busboy and then never looked back. I was a waiter, I was always a good waiter. I was a valet parker, I worked on the golf course and I was always waiting on people and serving people that apparently did well. You know, you're working there on Wednesday and someone's showing up to play golf at 11 o'clock in the afternoon, in the morning. It's like, what, you're not working? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm used to and they seem to have more wealth than the other guys. Driving up with yeah. a Cadillac. Um, some of them were not nice, but the ones that were, were, were nice give you five minutes of some stuff and you will ask them some questions and they will 
give you maybe the tip of Bias the day. Or wisdom. And just yeah, yeah. beautiful people. And that's where I picked it up. I, I, I said, you know, there's some sort of success here. And I, from that financial struggle, I didn't want it. And I'm going to say something sensitive. My mom always, and I said it on many podcasts already, and I'll say it again right now because I, I want to be transparent to anybody who's listening to this. The reason I did well, I didn't want to go back home. Because when I went back home, there was nothing but chaos and a lot of personalities. I call it passion. Just dysfunctional stuff. N no abuse, no sexual abuse, nothing. Just there was a lot of incoming traffic. A lot of chaos. Yeah. A lot of chaos. And it bothered me. And more so, we lived in a townhouse in Hialeah. Oh, God. And... Uh, White socks at Kmart. <laughs> and I'm gonna say it because this is this is I'm about giving value. That's a stage of my life right now. I'm a giver. We had to wear white socks all the way up to your knee. The reason we wore white socks, man, our house was fested with fleas. Wow. His mom is passionate about dogs, so there were yeah. so so wow. it was fested with fleas. We couldn't get the darn fleas out of the house. Yeah. And meaning that if you leave your bed and you go to the restroom, it's literally a sprint with the socks. And by the time you get there, I, I kid you not, covered with dots. And you take them off, you shake them. It was a constant process. So you probably back lo on. loved going to work to be outside of the house, right? Yeah. I realized that later on in life, because every time I went back, it was almost a negative aspect. And that's where a lot of this positive mental attitude PMA, because when I went back to work, it was affecting me at times because I was leaving, but I was getting relief by going. But coming back, I was, so the, the more I was away from home, the more, I, you know, so I, there's maybe a little situation going on there. Yeah, yeah. But um, massive fleas, man, massive fleas. My mom says, I can't believe you say this yeah, on podcast. Yeah, because she's a but, super <laughs> clean person. Like, yeah. you don't even know. And, and it was OCD, nothing. We, it, so. Just a whole neighborhood was fested with it in, in our yard. We, we lived on the side. We had dogs. Um, yeah, man. Um, That's crazy. But yeah. I, when I met Bobby, the, that first week that we kind of met, he totally just told me, I'm going to be my own boss. I'm going to own my own business. So I just want you to understand that, you know, front, yeah. where I'm going and I, this is what I'm going to be doing. And, um, I was like, okay, I didn't even know anything about business. To me, my family had no clue. And even though I had a brother that owned a business back then, but he lived in New York and I really... Didn't, I wasn't involved in the daily knowing what a business or entrepreneur was. So when Bobby told me that, um, he was 22 years old. And he's like, I don't know how, but I'm going to be a, my own boss. I'm going to own my own business. So, And like six months later, um, right before I got pregnant, um, I'll, I'll get to that one. But like two or three months into the relationship, he told me, why don't you like, stop working um, and let's try to open a business. And I was like, together, yeah. Together, yeah I'm like, uh, I have no clue of like what business is or whatever, um, but I said okay. I mean, I didn't have the you clue sure? either. What business? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was no business. Yeah. it was yeah. just manifesting a business. Yeah, and he just um, and I had bills I had to pay because my parents couldn't afford to pay my bills. So um, I said, "Are you sure?" You know, he's like, "Yeah, we'll figure it out. Let's do this." And um, we did, and we opened a little business that was like um, almost like, like a, a Craigslist, Craigslist. I want to say very similar to a Craigslist, but we, back then we didn't have internet. We didn't have the resources or the finance strength to be able to, for you know, take that business any further. So we had it going for like probably I don't even know. Six. We failed. We failed many times because what we wanted to do, Omar, we didn't want to go through the process. Looking back now, we didn't want to go through this process. We wanted to skip the process and open a business without any information, without any do a dollar. No knowledge. You want to go from A to Z <laughs> instead of A to B. A, we exactly. kept doing it, kept doing it out of desperation. And finally, we just got exhausted. We kept failing, failing, failing. And then we started ponying up, meaning we started getting jobs. Um, I started working at, after massive major mistakes, working at the Rusty Pelican, Key Biscayne in Miami. It's a famous restaurant even today, as a waiter. During the day, I was selling memberships for the Better Business Bureau. Sophia was the ultrasound tech. She went to some medical office. Tech school. And, or tech, you know, doing all that. And this is after a couple of businesses. This is after, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. major, is... major hurricanes, tornadoes, wasted energy. Was it, was it one business that you kept failing at or did you guys try no, multiple no, different businesses? Like, we tried everything. We tried it all, dude. We tried we'll, we'll a list of things. Off a uh, Craigslist, uh, we tried to do, uh, we, we, we saved up uh, $10,000 
uh, Eric, my brother, myself, and Sophie. <laughs> Architect and analysis. This is, a, this is a great, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. Yeah. We, we, I was obsessed with business opportunities because I, you know, when you get the tag, become a millionaire, uh, make $100,000 next month. I was, it was a magnet. I, I was, I just couldn't get away from it. These, these taglines. And I kept going to it. So, and one mistake, I went back to it again. All our life savings, we invest in this $10,000 business opportunity. And the business opportunity was that, hey, you go to, and it makes sense, you go to a, a, a tenant at an office building, and hey, how, do you, how many square feet are you paying in rent? Well, 5,000 square feet. Well, how do you know it's 5,000? Maybe it's 4,900. They should owe you 100 square feet of credit, mm, yeah. back credit. And if we are able to collect it from the landlord, we'll split the savings 50-50. Yeah, we get a percent of it. Yeah, yeah, got it. So we buy it. All three of us are sitting down. Who's going to go for the course, the seminar? It's a weekend seminar. You go. It was out of state. I mean, this was big. This was like a big board meeting. We we're so jacked up. Yeah. This is the vehicle, yeah. This yeah. is this the mother load. This is going to take us to it. the holy yeah. land. <laughs> After so many mistakes, we found it. Yeah. We, we found it. No more and, fleas. And, and, and everyone thinks... <laughs> It's an industry, a product, or service. The sauce is you. We need to know that. So we determined Bobby is the one that should go to the seminar to get it. We did, or Bobby did? No, no, yeah, no, no, I, no, I, no, I, no. I, no. We, we were very careful. We just sat down and we were like trying to see, okay, who's going to be the best one to go? Who yeah. has the because more? Because I like to ask questions. And yeah. when you ask questions, you're able to learn and Deduce, maybe pick up yeah. something. I go. They pick me. I go. Fast forward, the weekend finishes. I get back home. Yeah. They pick me up at the airport. I said, guys, we are gonna make so much freaking money. This is so, my God, we are gonna be rocking it. What? So tell so me, tell me. Down Let me tell you the story. Tell me, tell me. Oh my God, guys, this is so amazing. Okay, what do we do, guys? It's unbelievable. I didn't learn nothing because there was nothing to learn. I bought a package. I came back with no information because they were wowing me with a flash, the, the, the whole bazazz, and, and that's one thing on social media, a lot of people are stuck with the flash and all that. There's no information. Cars and all this, yeah. The so I came back yeah. with just full excitement. My brother goes, I get accounts. It, it turned out to be a homicide scene. Everyone goes to get a job. Eric goes his way, we go our way. So you guys don't even try that. You don't even no, try. we tried it. it oh, we just, tried it. it, it there was, was nothing. No customers. There was no. It, it, yeah. was a, it was. There was nothing there. Yeah. there it wasn't an opportunity. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> so fast forward. Yeah. It crushed us. It broke us. Yeah. We go back, but we know what to do. Get back. Start working. Get back. Start working. That, and we did make a couple more mistakes even after that. I'm waiting on tables, I'm selling the Better Business Bureau, I'm selling memberships to businesses, she's at the medical center. Uh, finally, that, that side eye, I looked at a classified ad. Again, <laughs> I, yeah. and I responded to a classified ad. What did it say? Some magical Make a million dollars. Statement, something like that. Yeah. But simultaneously, I got another classified ad, three more classified ads, I bring it back to the board. Guys, I think I found some stuff here. And the board is your wife and your brother. Yeah. At that time, it was just me it and my wife. It was me and it was just me. My, my brother, yeah. no mas. He was like, I'm done. <laughs> I, I don't to. trust you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I put three of them out. And at this time, I started bending to my relationship, my life partner that has my back with nothing but good intentions. She wants the same outcomes I do. I started now saying, Sophie, what do you think? And stop being the smartest person. Stop being reactive. And I started saying, man, what do you think? Because I've been striking out. <laughs> she pretty much picked this business, and we'll get into that. She goes, this looks really interesting. Simultaneously, I was selling a, a membership to the same company that was offering this package. Oh, coincidentally. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yes. There you go. So, and I didn't know that. I go there, I'm pitching the membership, simultaneously the package. I tell them it's the package. Hey, I also got one of your packages. He goes, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to buy this membership, which I don't believe in the membership. I think it's worthless. But I'll buy it <laughs> under two conditions. You can go ahead and buy that package. I'll give it away. I'll give it to you for $1,800. But I want you to start selling for me. So I said, yes, I'll do it. 
that was a game changer. That's the same business we sold that led us to a billion dollars today, our personal net worth of $300 million, $300 million more in cash flow and assets, and the list goes on. Wow. And the reason, I wanna stop and pause for a moment, the reason it worked, it wasn't the package, it wasn't the industry, it wasn't the product, we were more prepared. When an opportunity comes and you're prepared, magic happens. We started really learning from our mistakes and stop thinking about it was fast track and knowing that don't set ourselves up, set your expectations of forget about the million dollars. Let's just see if we can replace the income from our jobs. So, and I still worked on two jobs, so waiting you, at you, tables. So you shrunk your goals to more realistic ones. Yeah. And that's where the stage way down. Started getting more knowledge too. He started, we started researching started the business. Started slowing down a little bit. Yeah, being really realistic. Yeah. Next step, yes. next step. Knowing next that, step. hey, we're yeah. at this stage and I am looking all in here and doesn't, has no relevance, Omar, to where we're at. So it started working. And then it replaced the Better Business Bureau. Then I started selling in this business, financial services. And what were you guys and doing? And I kept waiting on tables. Specifically, what is it? Financial services uh, for, for health, healthcare? The healthcare community. Okay. So if you need a piece of equipment, an x-ray machine, an ultrasound, a copy or whatever, you find the business owner and these lenders want to place the money. The lender will pay us a commission when it's funded. But I became very good at it. Uh, my confidence started getting really good at it and my people skills kept Growing, improving yeah. greatly where I started saying, you know what? the power of listening is so much because sometimes when you don't allow someone to speak and you interrupt them, you may be missing a golden nugget there. And I started learning really quickly. And of course we had our daughter, so I'm going fast here. And, and our daughter was a major game changer. It, it became very real. How old were you when, when you um, had your daughter? I was 19 and he was 23 when we had our daughter. So By mistake, it so was the, not planned. So the failing businesses were happening right when you guys, when, right when you got pregnant? Oh, when we're boyfriend, girlfriend. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, we started, before, yeah. Pre and post. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pre and wow. post, yeah. And we've been together for 30 years, man. This is, my, this, this, is, this is everything I have in life. So was having a baby at that time a catalyst? Like, fuck, I really got to yes. figure this out it became fast. serious. Yeah. I remember uh, my, my wife and Priscilla, they were in a used car. Um, her, her parents, we lived with her parents for a long time, dude. And they got Sophie and me a car something they can afford and it was it was a clinger or whatever it was no it, no ac no ac and, and, in, and in south florida a lot of humidity a lot of heat and i'll never forget i came out of dixie and pedro's house we were living there sophie was picking me up for some reason she was with priscilla my daughter my baby girl the windows were down and she was in her car seat she was redder than a heart because it was so hot and she was sweating like galore for some reason it was always there, but for, we were always sweating like that. But for some reason, when I was out looking in, I, I was just so disappointed with myself saying, I got to stop bouncing and I got to start sticking. Um, and that business, uh, we took off, man. We, we, it, it took off one employee at a time. I didn't, I was so, I almost fell victim so many times to premature expanded and I didn't. When did you go from selling to starting your own, though? Where was that transition? Uh, pretty much six months. So six months and you thought, well, shit, I'm a good agent. I might as well start oh, my own the thing. The gentleman retired. Okay. His two uh, older uh, sons, they were in their 50s. He was really old. He lived in a neighborhood uh, which, for you guys in California, is called Beverly Hills. For us, this was a neighborhood in South Florida. And I used to drop him off because he couldn't see. And I used to, I used to dream about I said, one day I'm going to buy a home here. Uh, well, I, I wind up buying four homes. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Uh, years later. And I know you obviously used to tell Sophie, and Sophie mentioned this earlier before the interview, that his goal was always a billion. Yeah. Once we started, the, that billion dollar goal started when we opened up this business. Yeah. He kind of saw the, you the know, vision the vision scale, and the yeah. scale opportunity of this business. And he always said, if we reach a billion, I, I want to exit. And and then Check. I was, the, yeah. yeah, but but then I started learning even another mistake I was doing. I was, I started and I brought my brother in. I said, Eric, 50-50, dude, don't give me no money because I, I love my brother. He's everything and, and vice versa. And he came in, he became our partner, 50-50. We, we went rock and rolling. She was a funding coordinator. Barbie, Eric's wife was the funding coordinator. 
Eric was in operations and I was in sales. We did that for a number of years, maybe three years. So your family was the, the executive staff kind of thing? Yes, yeah. us yeah. four. It was just us four. And then we started expanding, bringing on people, but I was always the number one salesperson. And I was always responsible for the numbers. And I did that for a number of years in this company. So you were the CEO and selling? I was a president. Yeah. And I, and that's where I, I talk about building an enterprise. Right. So I wasn't given the value to the company because it was all about Bobby's potential. If Bobby goes on vacation, number goes down. Sales go down. Yeah. And it's not healthy. Then when I started waking up and started listening to people, including my brother, this and that, we started expanding, making others successful, hiring a better Bobby version started bending, surrendering, duplicating it, duplicating myself. It took off like this Hawaiian wave <laughs> and we just kept feeding it, feeding it, growing it with people, scaling with people. And then it became our customers were our people because our people were talking to our customers. And then we blew up a culture that's unbreakable today. How many employees did you guys uh, I We exited uh, six, seven months ago. And when we exited, we we're... 500 employees. 500 I, employees. Yeah. But talk to me again. I want to zoom in uh, on the key employees in the beginning because I think a lot of people get to a phase where they start building a team and then they get hung up at scale, right? It's one thing to be successful yourself. At what point did you remove yourself as actually the person selling and go, okay, from now on, I'm not going to sell anymore. I'm going to focus on training. I mean, t take me through what now might be not a big deal to you or so long ago, but take me to an entrepreneur who might be at that position where you're bringing on your first key employees, you're bringing on your sales reps. What do I look for? When do I let them go? Any insights on that? Yeah. You have to be willing to take a hit on revenue, net income. It will be an interruption because when you're so you're a dominant force responsible for revenue and you're the top producer and you're the owner it, and you're flying this plane that's 30,000 feet in the air and you have accountability of some employees, overhead, it's such a hard transition to say, I can't lose money. If I lose money, it's going to affect my pocket. That means I'm not going to make $250,000 this year. Yeah, my I can't lifestyle, interrupt. my car, man, whatever. Be yeah. willing to have interruption. Be willing to take that hit and rebuild with better versions of yourself. I didn't do that until about eight years ago. Just recently, dude. Yeah, so being unafraid to pay the best to fill in those positions. Once yeah. we took the hit and we said, you know what? Yes, it's going to be an interruption. There's no question about it. And it wasn't a big interruption. But most of us think it is. It's just a moment in time. So, so attack the white elephant, that big elephant that's in the room that nobody wants to confront or deal with it because we're just winging it along. But in order to scale, because if you have a business, I don't care what type of business, you wanna make sure your efforts that you're doing today, say you're making a million dollars a year, it's worth nothing if you can't sell it, if it's not worth nothing to the market. Right. So unless, that means that you, have, you can't be the control freak. You, you gotta let go, you gotta bring people in to help you scale and show that this company is scalable without your leadership. Or your face, yeah. You know, a lot of people, it's all I, I, me, 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 I, 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 I. You can't build a business. You cannot sell a business like I did and Sophie did for a billion dollars. You cannot create a $300 million personal net worth we bought real estate throughout the years when we started making money. I mean, when you start making $10, 20000000 million a year, um, it's equivalent to making even $100,000 a year. What do you do with your pennies and your money? And Sophie and I were smart enough to start racking it. We call it stack and rack. Save your money, rack them into investments when you see value. Then what we did, Omar, another mistake. Another mistake. In 05, Sophie and I were doing, it seemed like we were doing quite well for ourselves financially. Man. We did it, yeah. We did it, man. We're doing it. A couple million bucks 05 a year. 05 is yeah. around everybody was talking about real estate. Just like now. We're in 2020. Everyone thinks they're missing out. I got to get in. I got to get in. Get me in. <laughs> that was yeah. us. Yeah. Well, we got in, dude. We yeah. bought $80 million. Yeah. <laughs> we bought $80 million. We overpaid. We thought they, they were great deals. Like everyone thinks it's it a great deal today. Conversion You're overpaying. Style. Yeah. We overpaid and we over leveraged ourselves in a very frothy market. Oh shit, before the 08. Yeah, shit. Came crashing down. That business that I lost my attention to and I got distracted with this real estate situation, I neglected my business. And that business bailed us out of that mistake because we started up here. When you start up here, 
you miss a lot of information. If I if if I knew this information, I would never have bought there. Yeah, you swung a little wild on the real estate. I did it. So I, I tried to do what I did years ago, skip the process, and I had no idea we're in the height of the market. Shit. That that business that we sold for a billion saved our rear ends, yeah. bailed us out. Never again. Ever again. Yeah. We went back in the market in 2011. We had a little coin. Yeah. We rebuilt ourselves. I knew a lot more, but I didn't start here. We didn't start. We bought one home, two homes, 17 homes. Went from 17 homes. Okay, we're ready. We have information now. We know more or less the, the back and forth. We have cash Then we bought a duplex. Momentum. Yeah. No exaggeration. <laughs> Tri a, tr a triplex, fourplex. Four yeah. Five-plex, six-plex, eight-plex, 10, 12, so on. Just steps. To the we point where our last purchase was yeah. just, uh, I don't know, a few months ago, 400 units. Yeah. And we built it, and yes, we're cash flowing, call it 350 to $400,000 every single month for me and my family, Sophie, all our family, no tax implications. On top of the business. On top, on of, top of all, the and forget about the other business. That's a, that was a nine-figure net worth we earned, and we earned another nine-figure net worth in real estate. And what we did that, we started small and we started learning all this stuff. It started compounding. The strength of bona fide information, man, that's powerful. A lot of people right now think that you're missing out. What you're missing out is not getting the information in today's cycle. And if you don't know this process and you're playing that game at the height of the market, you too are gonna get damaged. And I see a lot of people over leveraging themselves, thinking they got a deal, so man, we learned so much, and, and what did good for Sophie and I, learning from the big mistakes. The small mistakes, those speed bumps, they're always gonna be there. Right. The big ones, if you don't repeat them, you can really get rewarded. Yeah, that, that um, episode that we went through in 2005, that it lasted like two to three years because the problem was we bought um, eight big buildings that were apartment rentals, but they were turning them into condo conversions. I don't know if you guys yeah, had yeah. that condo conversion steps here. So that, that process took almost a year and a half. So we were in the market of the worst time of, you know, real estate in Florida, around the world. Uh, but what we learned in that, in that whole process, we almost went bankrupt. Thank God for BHG, because if it wasn't for BHG, yeah, we, we, talked to a we wouldn't have been, we yeah. wouldn't have been here today. Oh, shit. Um, but we were able to survive it. But what we learned there was because we had to keep a couple of the buildings that we we didn't have to, we, we would go to the table to the, when we got rid of them, we got we would go to the closing table with millions of dollars at closing instead of get, getting money in our pockets we were coming to the closing table here take this junk we take it we don't want it yeah, yeah. whoever wants it here you go but what we learned there was with the buildings that we stayed with we started renting them back out and we were like and we really didn't know the the, the, the rental, rental market. market. We only knew, you know, buy and flip, buy did and flip. That's all we knew. We did our we did our own ourself. property management because we, we couldn't afford it. it. We couldn't afford it back then. We had to like, you know, jump in there. I actually jumped in. Me and his brother kind of took over that um, department, and Bobby went back to BHG to get BHG back up going because it was it wasn't doing bad, but it was just steady. It was just not going nowhere. So, so Bobby right. jumped back into distracted. BHG to get that going again. And me and his brother kind of went into the real estate um, and tried to get that going to so that we wouldn't go into bankrupt. But what we noticed was like, hold on a minute, we're renting this apartment. And we're able to at least cover the notes that we, you know, we had debt on these and high debt. I mean, we went and bought these properties that I don't even Just remember. Just high, high leverage. High Ridiculous leverage. leverage. So we we're like, okay, damn it. Wait a minute. We're renting these things. And at least we're covering some of the, you know, expenses on the property. But still in default of your loan covenants. Yeah, because of the vacancies, we were like, it was So crazy. basically, we were buying apartment buildings, Omar, renovating them, chopping all of them up into condos, and reselling them as condos, speculation. We decided, after learning from that, we want to hang on to properties forever. We never want to be in that situation again. I'd rather buy an apartment building conservative leverage, cash flow from day one, and treat it as a legacy. And we never stopped since then. Never stopped since then. What was the lowest point in whatever, 2006, seven, eight? What was the lowest point financially where you were like, holy shit, I don't know. Uh, when, we, we, uh, we were, uh, when we interviewed a bankruptcy attorney, that becomes very serious. Um, 
when because we were we were like saying we're, there's no way we can get out of this, yeah. and then we didn't realize how special this company BHG is. My gosh, it could probably get us out of this. And sure enough, all along she was there, man. She's always been taking care of us. That's why I'm so freaking emotional about leaving. It's always taking care of us. It, it's like the angel above looking after us, and it, it just continues to save us. And you know, we just went right back in our business. That's where no distractions comes from. Enough, Bobby. Stop getting distracted. I know I'm ADD, HDD, whatever they call me, and I am every bit of it, and I accept it, and I love it. But start focusing now. Yeah, Bobby didn't look at real estate from 2006, I think it was, or two, 2006, 2007, something like that. He didn't look at real estate so till 2011 that I begged him to because I was looking at all these foreclosures that I was able to get for $49,000, $29,000. I'm like, please, let's go back. And we, we had two buildings that were giving us, you know, rental yeah. income because of the 2006 episode. And you had built up the cash. But, to be but, able to, but it wasn't really giving us money because we bought it so high and our leverage was so high that we were just trying to just, you know, come afloat, just cover bills, just the, the expenses. But in 2011, I begged them, I'm like, please look at this. And I did look at it. I mean, that's when you talk about communication and relationships. I was so negative with it. I said, I was so obsessed and not getting distracted. So even though you were actually like learning about real estate, doing this for years, you literally were like, don't talk to me. He didn't want to hear about it. So it was like literally a rule. I went back yeah. in to rebuild our whole culture, all our, our partners. We, we don't call them employees, they're our partners. Went back in, fertilized it, and that's all I'm gonna do is feed my energy to this beautiful business. Sophie, from time to time, hey, this stuff is starting to look really good out there. I would ignore it, ignore it. And then of course, good communication. Yeah. You sit down at the table and I'm saying, okay. And, uh, and I think even back then, now talking about it, Omar, that's when Sophie and I got really polished, maybe even, even with yeah. our relationship. Because think about all that, all those crises. You know, how many people got divorced in 08, 09, committed suicide? Yeah. It, it was devastation. I know a lot of young people don't realize that because they were too young. We made it through, man. And um, yeah, if it wasn't for Sophie waking me up to get back into the real estate, be more humble, Bobby, what happened to us was our mistake. It was all us. We're, we're the solutions, the problems, or, and responsible for outcomes. And um, it's awesome, man. It, it, it's incredible, man. It's incredible when you stick together. When you, when you have a relationship like Sophie and I and anybody, any life partners, man, think about it. We have four legs. We have four fists. We have a better chance to win the fight together. Yeah. I mean, she's aligned with me. I'm aligned with her. We know our core values. We want the same thing out of life. What better freaking partner can you have? And you guys have been there from the very beginning from together. Yeah. Day one. I think your mom gave uh, Bobby like eighteen hundred dollars. Eighteen hundred bucks from her bra. So uh, <laughs> yeah, she used to keep you know, everything in her bra. Beautiful uh, yeah. Latina lady, um, beautiful Cuban lady, and and she had her beeper in there because back then there was no. We had those big phones. She had her beeper in there. Yeah, yeah. She had notes in there. She had all the savings. There was that no was bank like account, her. and yeah. it was a last money. And she, I'll never forget it. Dixie pulls it right out and believed in in us and um eighteen hundred dollars she eighteen hundred dollars to start the business yep to start this business with wow. zero in the bank account classified we, ad Made we didn't proud. even have we had a, a typewriter that we bought like i don't even know and a fax machine that's all we bought um to be able to start this business and we had nothing else yeah um no money to pay rent no money we lived with my parents and that's all we had backs were against the wall you had to make we it. had to make it what, what did you do differently when you focused on the business? After you guys lost everything, she focused on real estate. What are some things you did different? Because I'm sure anything you were doing when you came back to it, you could have been yeah. doing prior, but because you were distracted, you weren't focused on it. So what are some key things, one or two things that you did Loaded up with awesome people. Period. Went out, poached them, stole them, <laughs> overpaid, Paid them. Yeah. and it took off. Hired, there's a beautiful person, there, there's Juan Carlos, incredible. Uh, He's like my little brother. He still works for the company. Juan Carlos is from Mexico City. He's a scientist. He has made us so much money. I'm so grateful for my relationship with Juan. Juan, if you're looking at this or listening to this, I love you and Liz. And we also impacted his life. And people like Juan, we loaded up with. And, and guys, there's many Juans in BHE. I know I'm missing so many beautiful people. And because of you guys, Sophie and I are sitting here. And that's what we did, man. 
we, 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 we got better versions of ourselves and started paying attention to how passionate they are, what is their skill set, started setting up our lineup. Well, he or she's not a good quarterback, well, one heck of a receiver. You don't want to line up with people that know it all, that, that want every position. It creates chaos, confusion, nothing's cascaded down. I became very good at it then, looking at scale. And you'll be surprised when you you're surround yourself with this quality, they make you better, they make you think differently. You see things. You yeah. move the needle. So was there a big, I guess, what was the biggest challenge that you had to overcome that you had to actually be like, fuck it, I got to do it? Was it taking the financial hit to, to pay the best, to be around the best? Was it firing people sooner? I mean, Me. Okay. I had to overcome myself. How so? Ego's not your amigo. You just don't know it all. You can't be a control freak. You're, you're just going to be completely stuck. I was the freaking problem. And when you recognize you are the problem, you need people to come in in order to help you scale. You only, I only have, each of us only have so much skill set, so much capacity. And if, you, if, you, if you, 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 you fall victim of ignoring that and you try to do things that you're really spending wasted energy, why not bring someone in, leverage someone to help you grow, set them up to succeed. So if they succeed, you succeed. If you succeed, they succeed. It's an amazing model. It's been working for 100 years. I just didn't understand it because I let my ego, I've always been a beautiful way. I've never been disrespectful to no one. I'm always kind. I, it's been always my life. I'm a very kind person. But when I say an ego, I wanted to do everything. No one could do it freaking better. I was stupid. What about, what were some of the things like maybe during the growth that you realized you needed to double down on? Was there anything that you realized like, oh, I need to go extremely hard on this? Data. Data? Okay. Data was a game Just changer. The numbers, basically. So what data means, and I talked a little bit on a boot camp that we were fortunate enough to attend, data will drive you to your customer who wants and needs your product and more so can afford your product. And that's where pricing doesn't become an issue. Yeah, it's real. Pricing is an issue if they can't afford it, they don't really need it. That is wasted energy. You want to invest in data, which is very expensive, but it's a holy grail. So when you recognize a customer, that absolutely needs your product or service, can more than afford it, it's, it, it's teed up. So when we understood the, the data, it was amazing that we spent all our marketing dollar, dollars targeting the right profiles versus just using a shotgun approach, sloppy doppy, Bobby Castro style, and then you start using the Winston rifle. Yeah. But I didn't know that until we brought people in that knew that. So I had to surrender, Omar. I had to let people take over this department because I, I was incapable. I didn't know it, and I was just winging it. I'm good at this, but I'm horrible at that. That's why I say a lot of, a lot of CEOs, you could be a great CEO, but a horrible owner. You could be a great salesperson and a horrible entrepreneur. What is your strengths? Fuel it. Your weaknesses, you'll spend a lifetime trying to fix them. Just be aware of them. And delegate them, right? Put people yeah, in key that's places. That's a true leader, man, when you can delegate. Yeah. Okay, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see entrepreneurs making nowadays? Whether it be, you know, on social media or personal friends, people you see yeah. who might have these big aspirations, but, you know, they get stuck at whatever, half a million a year, a million a year, yeah. 10 million a year, whatever, that keeps them from, from scaling. I mean, what are some of the biggest mistakes? Distractions with all the flash, man. You remember that, that story? Bobby Castro was all over the place, so distracted. And I'm seeing some awesome, talented people, far more talented than myself and Sophie, being stuck because they're so distracted with, Oh my God, the Ferrari, the plane. And there's no information looking at this stuff. You're just wowing yourself and they're just stuck without actually getting information how to get to A to B and then go from B to C with more information. And I'm seeing so many people distracted. This stuff is easy. Well, Sophie and I did, looking back, this is really easy if you don't get distracted. Distracted means this, if you're on Instagram, Say you're following a thousand people. This is how I look at stats, talk about data. And so much income, and we have about 70,000 thoughts a day that all of us get in our subconscious mind, and somehow that comes out of your conscious mind. And hopefully you're just rolling the dice at some of it's positive, but most of it's a bunch of Donkey Kong. So you have a thousand followers, and say you're in the drapery business, and you're an entrepreneur. You should be following 
other entrepreneurs that are successful in the drapery business. You should not be following DJ X, um, Model X, everything that doesn't have any relevance to where you want to go. Yeah. I was distracted. You know, I, I, I knew where I wanted to go, but it, darn it, I kept, I kept getting it off the exit. And then you run out of gas, man. No distractions. That's where non-refundable minutes comes in, man. You don't get them back. Once you invest and spend your, your, your minute, no matter what, you don't get it back. So your job is to give value. Forget about receiving value. The only way you're going to receive value is give value. Yeah. Focus on giving, giving, giving value. Everything, a conversation, a customer, all your focus is on value. Things start appearing, man. It starts moving. Now, when you guys built that value to a billion, where was the point where you decided, like, okay, I want to have an exit? Do you, do you remember when the first talks yeah, came yeah. about? So I know you're telling me you're doing about 20 million a year in personal income. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, where, where was the point where you started thinking, huh, man, well, I can really sell this? Uh, uh, well, it came to us. Uh, an institution, uh, uh, a very big institution came saying, hey, we would love to buy into your company and we'll give you $250 million and we'll buy 30%. You guys still own 70, you still control the board, you're in full control, we're just passive. 250 million? <laughs> yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> and well, they did it. Wow. Money was wired. Did you negotiate it at all or just sort of? No, it was just, you know, it was you know, like, okay, let me just not stir it up if they want to <laughs> yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I thought you it was- Just be grateful. It yeah. was never gonna, I said, okay, let's see what happens. Yeah. What well, happened? Holy shit. And then, hmm, Wow, why would someone do that? We start looking into the process of information. After, after. After, yeah. instead of before. Remember I told you about that damn Syntax. 2005? Syntax, we made the, the mistake. Order. Yeah, yeah. Skipping wow. the process. The Holy shit. <laughs> we found out, good for them, they stole it. Wow. Good for them. But you know what, now we know information we didn't know that we should have paid attention to, that we didn't pay attention to because we were distracted. Good. 11 months, not 12 months, 11 months. We went back to these beautiful, awesome partners. Hey, you have the first right refusal in the, in the transaction to buy if we decide to sell more slices of the pizza. Well, we wanna sell 19% more. We still wanna own and control 51%, but we wanna take 19% more off the table, the chips off the table. So you still have controlling stake at 51, yes. okay. But at 600 million. Mm -hmm. Additional. You kidding me? I just paid 250 11 months ago. No, I know. I, I, I totally get it. I understand. Yeah. It closed. 600 million. 600 million. The power of information. Then more fuel. It's just kept fueling it. Now we knew the power of new information on how to force appreciation in a, in a company. We knew how to force it yeah. in, a, in yeah. apartment buildings. You increase rent. Right. In this, you increase revenue and you watch your bottom line and you control expenses. You get all the uncontrollable expenses and you get them under control. And then three years later, Sylvie and I exited for a billion dollars, our last 17%. It was $170 million, all cash. All three were all cash. Uh, no, no hold back, yeah, no, no, uh, no you know, none of that stuff. Holy shit, all cash. And during, all cash. Yes, and during that process, Omar, we were building that $300 million portfolio that just been taking care of me and my family so much. Um, and we're, con we're gonna continue growing that and, and we're managing our investments. The power, ugh, I get so freaking pumped. <laughs> the power of information. It's so powerful, but you're never gonna get it because you're distracted. The power of not getting distracted is a prime example of what I just outlined. Imagine if you're extremely focused on your business. This boot camp I just came from, yeah. I was speaking to beautiful people. They have $850,000 savings in the bank. Great businesses. Bobby, what do you think about real estate? What do you think about, Bobby, what do you think about real estate? And I'm, and I'm talking to them, tell me more about your business. But they want to know, and I'm saying, oh my God, pay attention to this business. Real estate's not going nowhere. You're not missing out nothing. Pay attention to your business, because if you don't pay attention to your business, it's going to happen to you too, but you may not be as lucky. You may go out of business, because right now the internet is so powerful. It, it's subbing businesses and jobs. It's creating efficiencies and savings for your customers. And you're just being distracted. You're not paying attention. You may be out of business and you're worried about getting into real estate if you have a business. Holy cow. So talk to yeah. me about this. 
Take me to the first wire transfer. It was a 250 million. So when the money hits the account, what's, what's the first yeah. thing you guys did? I cried. <laughs> yeah, she got emotional, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I'll say my story real quick. Yeah. I was with my son-in-law, Eddie. He was at my desk, he worked for the company. Yeah. It came in, gave me the big hug, and my son-in-law, man, he's like 100 feet tall and just <laughs> beautiful bear. I didn't, it didn't phase me. I can honestly tell you the second one didn't phase me. The third one, I was finally proud of myself. Um, that's, that's my little story. Yeah, when we you? got that first one, I, I was so emotional just because we came from nothing. We started this business with zero dollars and that we were able to get an evaluation of getting $250 million. And you know, that was like, wow. I was like super proud, yeah. emotionally proud because I was like, I can't believe we did this. Like, yeah. really? And I thought it was a great idea. And then I look at him and he's like, uh, it's, it's okay. It's, you know, whatever. And I'm like, what are you, like, do you have any feelings inside yeah, of you? Like, yeah. what do you Maybe mean? Omar I was, was like, overwhelmed so that I didn't realize excited. it. Who knows? Um, I know Sophie was very emotional. Um, she felt a little pressure. And, and this is going back to this family topic, man. We all deal with it. She felt, uh, she started crying and she was emotional. Um, and she felt bad for her family. Well, how beautiful is that? Wow. And, and I told her, I said, Sophie, man, it's all going to be okay. And um, yeah, man, yeah, I remember <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I felt like, not, and I can't say guilty because I don't like that word guilty because we worked our asses off. Right. Uh, this wasn't given to us. This was not here you know, because you're nice guys. Here you go. We worked our butts off for years and still continue to do. We go to the office every single day. But I felt like, you know, my God, I have family members that don't even have enough to like really cover their bills for the month, you yeah, know? Yeah, exactly. And the same with him. So I kind of like, I, I felt very proud and happy and excited that we had that kind of money and we were considered millionaires at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that I had family members that had, you know, they couldn't make day to day. Yeah, you can't see past 30 you know? days. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Holy shit. And the second one, the 600 million, that was the second one? Second one, no, because I was so excited, Omar, how it works. How you can actually now create value, tangible value that's worth something to someone. It's like, wow, that's what I'm telling. I'm begging entrepreneurs, man. Make sure your efforts is about wealth, not about rich. If you focus long-term efforts on wealth, rich comes along the path yeah. because make sure you build your business that is worth something to somebody. It's so important. If you're gonna be the one-man shop and you have 100 employees, 10 employees, and you're gonna be that old Bobby Castro that's the front and center of the business, it's worth nothing. It's, it's not an enterprise. So be, be careful on that. If, if entrepreneurs should be really Focus on what is what can I create valuation on my company yeah. if I decide to exit at the same time making millions of dollars. You know, that's something that's really um, that I encourage a lot of the entrepreneurs um, out there to do. At the very beginning, for us, being rich was what we wanted, right? We had no clue what wealth was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs understand this because I came to understand this maybe three, four years ago when we did the second, um, you know, sale of the company that I uh, came to understand what wanting to be, wanting to be wealthy. I didn't want to be rich, but I thought rich was where you wanted to be. And a lot of entrepreneurs um, run their life wanting to be rich. As the finish line. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to be rich. I want to have a plane. I want to have a car. Um, I want this mansion. I want to go on these elaborate vacations. I just want to be rich. And being rich ends at a point yeah. because you could use that money. You, you do it for the wrong reasons and that rich ends. You know, wanting to be wealthy, it creates long-term legacies. And that's like really hard to understand. And I still talk to a lot of entrepreneurs that are doing very well for themselves and they don't understand the concept of wealth. Yeah. You know, and I think that's a big mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs yeah. out there Legacy, have. man. We're, we're on the 100 year legacy plan right now. This is, this is where we're at, Omar. The stats are scary that we just got ourselves exposed to. Um, it's a highly success rate, this is what happens. Two beautiful individuals create some sort of wealth. Then we grow old and gray. And then two beautiful individuals, my daughter and my son, our daughter and our son is now taking over. They wind up spending it all. 
wasting it all, <laughs> burning it all, yeah. getting distracted. And then my grandbabies, third generation has nothing. That stat is like a 70, 80% stat. That, that's what happens. Yeah. And now we're, we're consulting with individuals. We belong to an awesome organization with about 700 members. We're two of the 700 and a total combined net worth of $80 billion. The, these are individuals that have, mul that have exited multiple times. So it's like a high level mastermind coaching yes. program. Huge. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, where I was able, we were able to spend, for example, having access one-on-one -on -one with Richard Branson, spending some beautiful time at his home. You know, th this is the For type babies. of level. And, and, and now we're on this 100-year plan. So check this out. Imagine the motivation Sophie and I have. This is what it is. In 100 years, one of our grandchildren, great, 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 great grandchildren is asked the question, hey, you know, how'd you guys get Castro on that building, that, that name of the building? Papa, Bobby, and Mimi. They did wow. it. And there's gonna be principles, there's core values in this legacy plan and my kids are, I mean, it's gonna be like a board level where if you wanna do an investment, it has to be in compliance, it has to pass filter, it has to be within the core values of the family's you know, thesis, investments. And just that alone is overwhelming for us. This is all new information. And it's getting our attention now because we're responsible and accountable for our legacy because no one in my family or Sophie's family ever thought about that. Imagine having one of your relatives a hundred years ago thought, thought about, about you. Is that powerful? Yeah. Yeah. Super that, important so that's where us. we're at in life. And, and when, I'm on, when we're on social media, we're just trying to share this on stuff that we're learning, what we have learned with as many people who want to listen to it because I'm, I'm very urgent about this because I believe this is what's going to happen in 15, 20 years. Middle class is going to be completely gone. Technology is a beautiful theme. It's efficient. It's awesome. But it's dangerous because it's subbing jobs. It's subbing the secretary. It's subbing all 90% of where people live and do. And if you don't do something about the fact of the reality about it, and you're a secretary and you don't fight and pay attention to how do I get a promotion, you're gonna be in trouble. You're gonna be in trouble. So why I know this information, because I'm digging through this information, it's scary. So if you spend time on the internet, social media, and you're sc scrolling through and just being stuck, spend time of what's gonna happen in the next 20 years to middle class. And I promise you, it's gonna get your attention you're gonna start taking massive urgent action. You're gonna get a second job, a third job. You're gonna start paying attention. Automatically, you will not get distracted. Hey, I don't have time for you because a lot of friends is a full-time job. I need to get my crap together. Yeah. Now, talk to me about this. A big theme in what you're talking about is coaching and knowledge learning. Talk to me a little bit off camera. You talked about how the first um, transaction was, I know it was 250 million, and you saw like, holy shit, they got this for a steal because you didn't know that you could sell it yes. at multiple times value of X revenue or whatever, depending on the industry. Talk to me a little bit about you know, the, the information that you're inputting in your brain, but then you approach them 11 months later and talking about 600 million. What was the psychology of, of you know, what did you learn and what advice do you have for people? Because you could have made more on that first, that oh, first yes, transaction. Yes, 1,000%. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, so the audience could get context of how important the details are. The details are, it, it goes back to the information. So if you're running a business, I don't care how small, how big, how medium it is, or the industry or product or service, what is the market willing to pay for? It's just almost like, who is my customer? How does my customer behave? What is really my solution? Do I really have scale? We determined that we had scale. We didn't realize how big of a scale. So the question is, do you really know how much scale you have in your business? What are the multiples? We had no clue what a multiple is. So you literally uh, just sold it not knowing too yeah, much about it. Dude, 1,000%. Just... Somebody that have known, they're, tw they're maybe $23 billion institution. And we've been dealing with this institution before the first slice for a few years. So they got to know us, they started looking on how this, this goes, and that's the power of relationships. They were just paying attention, and they're the ones who presented the opportunity to us. you know. And um, we had no clue, and we should have had a clue of what we're building. What is all your efforts for? What is it truly worth? Are you just doing your business for a job, or you're trying to really create wealth? 
A lot of people have these business owners, just because you're getting paid $250,000, you're, you're missing it. You should be getting paid 100000 and putting the 150 back in your business. And why you should be motivated on it, because when you research the information of why you should reinvest in your business, you will find out because it's worth this much more if I do this much more. So we were, to answer your question, we were spending a lot of energy on this when we should have been paying attention to here. Yeah. You don't know that without the information. So all we did was, we're here, we just started looking here. And then you guys gave them that valuation based on the projection of revenue based, for based X on what the years. market tells us it's worth. This would we could have went to anyone; they would have paid it. So, like how every industry has a different multiple, yes, sir. right? Yes. So, give, give an example of that. Just so, the so a lot of I, I say this a lot on my social media. There's a website, and I would recommend you go into it: PitchBook.com. Private equity and VCs all over there, and how private equity works. They'll wind up meeting an Omar. And they'll stay in touch with Omar, and that's what the power of relationships. They see that you're a, you're, you're a serious entrepreneur, you have extreme focus, you have some possibilities. They stay in touch with you. They just wanna see the growth. So the power of relationships. So if, if you go to pitchbook.com, you're gonna find out so much about what I'm talking about, about valuations on how to invest your efforts better versus wasted energy, that pitchbook.com. And I warn you, don't go too deep in this stuff because you'll get lost. And when you get lost, you're stuck. So you gotta watch the information too, Omar, because if you dive too, too deep, you may not come up. Yeah. So <laughs> dive at the stage you're at. Just go, if you're at three feet, just go three feet. Don't go through the, the damn concrete and through the pipes <laughs> because you, you won't come out. I've been there before. And lucky enough, I squeezed out. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, no, it makes sense, yeah. So you basically just did your homework on the fact that in your industry, you could sell it at X amount of years revenue. And, and the only reason the homework was done, an event happened. But we were lazy daisies. We should have been more on it, paying attention. What are we creating? What are we building? Because all we keep leaning on this poor company is to get us out of a jam. Yeah, it was like your insurance policy in a yeah. sense. We're yeah, distracted. Yeah. Okay, now talk to me a little bit about, you guys built this phenomenal business. Obviously, you guys have rode roller coasters together. Um, 30 years of marriage, congratulations on that. 29, October 6th was our, and we celebrated in, it was in Africa. Uh, 30 yeah. together, 29 married. Have there ever been any tight times, and it's kind of personal, but where, you know, maybe you guys almost kind of divorced, or maybe you talked yes. about that potential. And yes. It, uh, talk to me a little bit about how you guys rode those waves and sort of uh, ended up coming out uh, yeah. successfully. Well, uh, with full transparency, um, I almost screwed it up, um, getting distracted, um, not paying attention to, you know, when, when, when you meet someone, you don't fall in love with someone right away. You continue falling in love with this process with somebody. Every, every day I learn something new from Sophie because we're, we, we know how to communicate good. I almost screwed it up um, because I got distracted in my marriage. Um, and um, yeah, Sophie almost left me. She almost left me and I'm so grateful that she did it, man. And I don't even know how she did it, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I would say, you know. yeah, I would say we, that happened to us um, twice in our marriage. Well, the first time it was like not even a year into our marriage. We were 19 years, I was 19, he was 23 years old. We had just had a baby. We didn't know each other. Uh, crazy. We had no money. You know, it, it was just a lot of craziness going on in our life. So to me, that one, I really don't count it, but I actually, I, I should count it because of course, we because really I asked her to marry me. We really. And, what the hell was I thinking? We I were her able to. I'm all over the place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And we were able to survive it because um, we kind of like started talking about it, and you know, I sat down with him. I'm like, okay, do you want this or you don't want this? Whatever. Yeah. So we kind of spoke about it, communicated about it. We tried it. We went back, and it worked really nicely and everything. Then back in uh, in 2005, actually, when that whole craziness of we were gonna lose everything. We were gonna go into bankrupt. Oh my God, other. we're gonna blame yeah, each other. Yeah. We were doing this, we were doing that. Distracted again in the whole nine yards. And that one, um, I really think is where we really sat down and we said, wait a minute, what are we doing? We really wanna be with each other and we're just losing focus of our core values. And our core values was always communicate 
we have, you know, having a vision together of where we want to end up, always having a goal um, and yeah. trusting each other and supporting each other on whatever decisions we make, whether if it's personal or, or business. And in that one uh, time that we went through like really rough times, we kind of sat down and like really said, you know what, from now on, whatever happens, whether it's good or bad, we need to sit down and communicate and ex you know talk to each other of what's happening. Yeah. Don't let this momentum just start doing this. Instead, try to stay here and, and walk together. And I think that that's really- Get, get over that, that mountain. Getting that, yeah, get over that hump. It was stupidities too. We were, we were fighting over you know, stupid things that we couldn't control was, you know, financial stupidities, um, blaming each other for things instead of working together. And, you know, now we, that's been what, that was in 05. So it's been, you know, 15 years. I don't think we've ever had a time where we said, hey, Sorry we're going to break up. No more. Now what we do is that we have a little argument, even if it's business, because Bobby and me and personalities, we have a complete different, yeah. but, but we have different personalities. Yeah. Bobby's a very, you got to do things right now. Bobby's a right now. If he has a to-do list, his to-do list gets done now. If he has a phone call that he has to reply to, if he has an email that he has to reply, it's now. I'm not that now. I, I have my to-do list, but I could, you know, I, I do my stuff as I go. I don't pace rush it. my, I pace it. I know yeah. how to, I know that I need to get it done you know, before a certain due date or a By timeline, the end of the day or whatever, but yeah. right, but I'm not right now. So we have that little balancing that he wants it now. I don't need it right now. So we've learned to manage that. So whenever we have that little argument, even at work or if it's personal, we kind of said, if it's not going to divorce, if you're not going to get divorced by it, walk away. Take your minute, take an hour, take whatever, and we come back and we discuss it because why are we going to create this chaos, this negative energy towards each other when it's a stupid fight or a stupid thing that could get what fixed? What the power of 20 minutes? If you just, uh, just <laughs> so, give each other 20 minutes, it's yeah. Yeah. pretty so good. Yeah, so if it's not excessive that we know that we're not breaking up for it, we don't argue. And another thing like I, I want to quickly at least let your viewers know, Omar, um, if you're in business and your wife is not involved in the business, you both have to be aligned because what's gonna happen is you're gonna go home or, or vice versa if your husband's not involved in your business or even in your careers, jobs. Communicate about it. Bring the other individual in because you're taking it home. You're gonna talk about it. And if the other party, your other life partner is not aware, it's not up to speed on the situation, it's gonna create disagreements because they're on the same page. So make sure you align each other. And I think that was good with Sophie and I because I do see a lot of couples where they don't let maybe their, their wife too much involved in the business or know more about the business or vice versa. They don't have an interest you, or you whatever. You have yeah. to because you're going home with all this. Building a business becomes frustrating, struggles. Um, it becomes a mental warfare. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't have your life partner to bounce things off you, yeah. like me with Sophie. And I say, Sophie, what do you think? I mean, because yeah. think about the power of just communication and working as a partner. Because if you could do it as your business partner, but you can't do it as your life partner. And a lot of people say, well, and how do you guys work out together? You go everywhere together. I never see you by yourself. You're always with each <laughs> other. How do you guys do it? How do you yeah. not get sick of each other? Yeah. I don't know, man. It, 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 we're benefiting we from it. Yeah. Yeah, we actually enjoy it. We, we do everything together. I mean, we, we just keep getting it's, paid in life. But I think, Forget about know, the financial rewards. Yeah. Yeah. I'm around my, 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 oh, look at all my children, my grandbabies. Yeah, I love it. We're I here, mean, yeah, you're here, you brought your whole family, yeah. your this mom, is so, your kids, dude, your this is, yeah. We are united, dude. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about off camera. You mentioned also that sometimes you run into the trap if you're in a relationship constantly getting in arguments that it can kill the sexual chemistry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, talk about that. I love I think that. That's so important. A lot of people Good. don't talk I'm about that. I'm glad you brought yeah. it up. So check this out um, just as an example. Say you're arguing or for a moment in time, some verbal thing comes up. You say something you don't mean and it's just stupid. And one thing's said, the other one said, and, and it builds up to this friction and it takes, it takes, over, it, it becomes alive. This momentum becomes like, crap, we're arguing about a piece of paper, now we're like talking about divorce. It's like, so stupid, wasted <laughs> energy. Yeah. Imagine how long, how many days, how many hours, you don't even want to see your partner, touch your partner, and you come home, it's happened to me, it's happened to her, even you argue in the morning, even, because I'm one, when you argue, it can last for days sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so you come home that night, yeah. 
it's still that friction, still that, that vibe Tension, going on. Yeah, yeah. The sexual stimulation is not there. I don't care what anyone says, it's not there. So just imagine the power of that. If you let it get wider and wider, that's where a lot of people find themselves in trouble, I think, yeah. in their marriages. But now if you're so kind, like a couple days ago, Sophie got roses for me. I always tell her I love you. She says, love you. We send some dirty texts to one another, <laughs> you know, getting it, you know, yeah, yeah, 30 whatever, years yeah. old. I mean, and, and, and you, that stuff keeps bouncing. You're playing ping pong and just having fun and you just get stimulated with each other. Yeah. Now, if you start arguing with each other, it's, it's a turnoff. Yeah. Yeah. It is a, it's a turnoff. I did a post recently um, talking about this that sex is uh, very high up on, on the importance and living, you know, getting a relationship to last for a long uh, period of time. Um, and a lot of people, oh, sex is not really an important. It is because when you do have that intimate yeah. moment with each other, even if you're upset with each other or that you didn't like what he did or he didn't take out that stupid ass garbage or this or that. When, yeah, because I hate yeah. that, that whole thing that they tell me, oh, my husband didn't take out the garbage. I'm not going to have sex with him today. I'm like, oh my God, please. But when you do have that intimate moment, you're able to release all of that, you know, yeah aroma in your life that you're like, oh my God, you know what? He's so awesome. She's so great. Oh my God. You're able to hug each other. You're able to love each other. And that makes you forget about many things that are stupid. They're, they're little stupid little things in your relationship that, that you think that they're so big, but once little you're able bumps. to, to yeah. do that and you're, you're, you're intimate with each other, everything else is so easy to forgive. If you want to have a good sex life in your marriage, this is Two you people know? have been together for 30 years. <laughs> if you want to have a hot, stimulating sex life, costumes are involved, the whole <laughs> darn thing, you continue stimulating each other, treat each other with kind, tell her she's sexy, uh, just feed it, <laughs> and she's going to feed it back to you. This thing starts coming alive, and you start falling in love. You don't start looking sideways. You're just focused. Was the communication always in the rapport that you guys have now or no? Because uh, I could imagine with your... It your, got very good 15 years ago. Yeah. But so when you guys first start off, I could imagine, because you're like a passionate, intense yes. dude. She's more mellow. In the beginning, was it like, I need this now? Yes, I, I was stubborn. And she was yeah. like, and you were probably like I was too intense. Yeah. And I didn't realize that there's something that everyone should take, and it's free. Uh, we paid a lot of money in our company for it, but it's free. You <laughs> go to Google. Yeah. DISC. D-I-S-C. Oh, the personality assessment. It's an yeah. assessment. It's so important for your relationship. A business, it's a no-brainer. You should do it with your employees. You should do it with your partnerships. But if you have a marriage, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever the case is, each of you take the assessment, sit down, talk about it. Chances are, 95% chance, the profile you're gonna read is you. But guess what? That, your partner, is a different profile. He or she relates to things differently. You may have to speak a little softer, slower, and as long as you know how they're wired, chances for success rise. And it, it helped us because now I know how she's wired. I know how to come across a better way, maybe have her more dialed into something I want her to pay attention to of a topic I want to talk about. She definitely knows how I'm wired. I am kind of all over the place. And when, you, when you're aligned, it's awesome. So, if, you know, they do it in business, the disc, yeah. but many people don't do it in relationships. Totally. No. How about you, Sophie? Because that must have been tough for you initially to figure out how to adjust to his pace of intensity. I want to achieve, I want to get to a billion dollars. And you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> we don't have much. Um, how did you adapt? How did you adjust to figure um, out his It was his difficult. Yeah. Uh, like I said, at the very beginning, it's very difficult because he's that right now. He's very strong. He's a very alpha personality. And believe it or not, I'm alpha too. I'm like a very strong personality, but he over, his personality is so um, dominant. He's so focused that, He's, he's driven. Yeah. So even though that I'm strong personality, I, I didn't have that driven in that right now. It, it's important to do it now. So at the very beginning, it was difficult. I was a mom at 19 years old. I, I had to take care of the baby no matter what. I mean, he, you know, he was a father, but moms always have more responsibilities with the babies, you know, being that we had the business and the whole nine yards. So it was very difficult at the very beginning. I cried for years sometimes because um, I needed to adapt to his yeah. personality. Um, and I, I was like more 
subtle, more, you know, I'll get there, I'll get there. And he was, now, now. But, you know, I luckily, I, I don't know if it was, I think it was so much that we were, um, our, our love for each other. And I knew what he wanted was the best for us. He wasn't doing it because he wanted to hurt me or bring me down that I was able to mold into his way and start learning how to, you know, cope with that personality and start learning to try to be more like him. And, you know, I'm thankful for it because today has made me a, a great entrepreneur and understand that, you know, it is important to be focused and to want that right now. Because if you don't, you sit back and you let life just go ahead of you or get stuck in, in a level and never want to move up, you know? So yeah. I'm really grateful for it. Um, it was difficult. A hundred percent was it difficult. <laughs> yes, it was. But you know, he has a personality that even though he had such a strength of a personality and so alpha that, but he always, believe it or not, was very caring to me. He was always, he never left me behind. He never wanted to, you know, he was a he type He never of, gave up on you. Never. Yeah, yeah. He, and he never was a person, a guy that said, no, you're going to stay home um, and you're going to be a mom and I'm going to be the businessman. And yeah. no, he always included me. Um, in the business, he always, in, you know, we were always together. Did always. you appreciate it initially, or were you kind of wrong? at the beginning? I really didn't understand yeah. it. You know, yeah. it's not that I didn't, not I didn't appreciate it, or I didn't hate it. It was just not understanding. But I, but overall, I did know that all he wanted was the best for us. Gotcha. So that's what kept me, you know, wanting game. to get better and and try to keep up with him. So last question on that. Um, for women who are watching this and maybe have a significant other, they're in the same situation, maybe early on in their career or marriage or relationship or whatever, what advice would you give them if they're dealing with a partner that they're trying to figure out how to adapt to and staying in the relationships, you know, not, you know, adjusting to be on the same page? Um, I would tell, you, you know, I tell all the women this, you know, you have to be aligned with your partner, whether you're in business with them or not. Even if you have your own career, he has his own career. Regardless of the situation, at the end of the day, your final goal needs to be the same and you need to be aligned and be in the same, you know, even if you're aside by him, you know, you guys have to end up at the same goal. So you need to hold each other's hand, support each other, trust each other, have the same vision and go for it. And, and the women out there um, are sometimes afraid to try to keep up with their husbands or go into business with their husbands because they're women or because whatever it is, do it. You know, you you at the end of the day, you're gonna be yeah. better off. You have the same goals. You wanna both be better. So just go and be, hold their hand. If you don't wanna be in business, I understand some women are not made to be entrepreneurs. They like to be stay-home moms, and that is perfectly fine, but that doesn't mean that you cannot be aligned with your husband, support him, trust him on where he's going, and end at the end at the, at the end goal. All right, so two more questions. Um, why real estate, and what's your best advice to people who want to get into real estate, want to grow? I love that you said you got a house, and you got a duplex, and then you got three, and then you got four, it literally step by step by step. Uh, would, knowing what you know now, would you still recommend that to people who maybe want to get into real estate investing or flipping? What would be your best advice to people who maybe have capital and want to get into real estate and want to really build long-term wealth? Real estate is, is so awesome. There, there's so many awesome benefits to real estate. Um, and it's so powerful. You know, Sophie and I just bought a couple deals, $108 million worth of deals. Were they the best deals? No. Yeah. But it was a value add to us because remember that transaction we just exited? We're, we're going to pay millions, plural, S at the end, millions less in taxes because of that, those purchases. Besides the cash flow we get from them. So that's a great value add. That makes sense for Bobby and Sophie at the stage where we're at. Now, if you're somebody that has $100,000, $50,000, or you don't have nothing, you aspire to do real estate. For the ones that don't have enough money to get into real estate and they may be asking grandma or mom or sister, brother or friends and family to invest, please don't do that. Please do what I should have done before I made the mistake. Find out how to invest in real estate. Find out everything you can. You don't have to pay for it. It's, it's free on, look up Sam Sell. He'll tell you exactly. And when you have all this information, you're diving in the information, you're learning about the information of the cycle we're in, because in real estate, the success is on the buy. 
it's never on the sale. You have to, you have to focus on the buy. So as you're learning this information, you could be stacking. Stacking means you get save. Get out of credit card debt, start, stop overspending, stop, start paying attention to the pennies. Every penny can be compounded in a down or kind of down movement. You can make 10, five to 10 times more than you can in a market we're in now. So if you don't have money, man, don't be lazy. Don't get crazy like Bobby all over the place. Dial and get focused. I need to learn about this, but at the same time, I have to maximize my 24 hours, these non-refundable minutes. If you have a job and you're kicking butt at a job, fantastic, do better at that job, get another job. You gotta be willing to surrender. I was one that surrendered, I became a waiter. I used to wait on people that I used to go out with. That's how humble I became. I finally had a surrender. And if you're somebody that do, does have some economics or if you're somebody that's involved in real estate, just know this, we're in a cycle that is very, very frothy. There's $1.8 trillion that private equity have, has that is looking to place to any heartbeat, anything. You are competing on that. Well, Bobby, they don't compete on the duplexes and fourplexes. I agree. That's even more of a dangerous pocket because those are inexperienced investors overpaying. You think you got a deal and I'm telling you beautiful people, you overpaid. You're not missing nothing in this market. Let this market settle. Find out where it's gonna go, so check it out. Sophie and I have an investment thesis here. No matter what, we don't break those core values. We used to break them. So if you have your core values here as your investment thesis, and the, market, the market's here, your underwriting's here, but now the market just shuffled. You cannot shuffle with it. You gotta stay with your core values. Well, I'm not gonna buy nothing then, Bobby. Well, I guess you're not gonna buy nothing. Do you wanna become wealthy or do you wanna Stay broke. I just think long term. Yeah. Long term efforts. Real estate's always going to be around. Why I love real estate? I'm, I gave you a couple examples. It gives me cash. It gives me my family cash flow from day one. I do not depend on a dollar increase. If it happens, it happens. I don't depend on appreciation. I don't even depend on taxes. Just pretend it don't exist, which they do exist. I just want the cash flow. I love real estate because it's not a threat to technology. One thing we need is this roof. Yeah. Right now. We're probably golden for the next 100 years. Technology is not going to sub a roof. It is awesome. Everybody needs it. It's an absolute requirement, a roof. I liked, Sophie and I like to live in rents $1,100 to $1,600. That is where we swim in. So That's where 90% yeah. of people swim in. These are beautiful people. I, we are not ones that get the high rises. The, you know, we have Luxury. a couple thousand yeah. units. and We just live where beautiful people live that may never own a home or areas that we keep track of is where job growth is, where it makes more sense to rent than buy. There's not too much construction going on. Um, you know, there, there, there's pockets in the US. We stay away from areas that, that, that are even talking about rent control right. um, because we're long-term thinkers. Um, and we used to not be long-term thinkers. We used to just try to get rich versus trying to get wealthy. And it's the same friggin' energy. And you get rich anyways on the way to wealth. Yeah. It's exactly. a given. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, exactly. so how many apartments are you guys at? Talk a little bit about we cash We have about maybe, we're probably there. all in, involved in about 6,000 units. Um, we own 2,000 units ourselves, just Sophie and I and our kids. Um, we used to manage all those, by the way. We were, we were pretty good at it. And now just recently, we handed that management over to a very large management company that can do it much efficient, more affordable. It makes sense. So we can focus on investments because we're in a market that you now need to be on high alert. Why do I want to buy this? Why am I the lucky one? Why am I trying to get, I, I, I fall victim every day of this, Omar. Yeah. I'm on the toilet <laughs> and I'm going through deal flow, deal flow, spending 20 minutes of my non-refundable minutes, I still fall victim. And I finally say, Why am, what am I doing? Why am I trying to convince myself this is a deal? This is not even a deal. Darn it, I just burned 20 minutes. I fall victim. So if I do it and I am that extreme individual focus, I can imagine what others are doing. Especially people aspiring who haven't really tasted yes. true wealth. Man, I, yeah. I, I ran into some beautiful people this weekend, awesome businesses like I talked about, and I tell them this, half hour late or an hour later, I go to the bathroom really quick before I have to speak again. Hey, Bobby, I have a deal I want you to look at. Um, it's, and I, I don't tell them this, but I look at them saying, you're like Bob, you're like the old Bobby. It's just going here and it's racing out there. Yeah. And I get it, I get it. 
and, and they're getting distracted because as, as you're digesting information, like as I'm talking to you, I'm already thinking about 10 things, things going on, but they're productive things. They're real things. It's such a danger. It's real estate in all cycles, you can make money. You just need to be on high alert in this cycle. So you have a V upside down, Omar. For the last 10 years, we were going from the bottom all the way up, right? And now we're up here. And I tell everyone, they wanna buy up here. And I tell them, what have you been doing for 10 years? You haven't been paying attention to your this? And now you have the audacity? You wanna get in the game now? What have you been doing? Well, Bobby, I was, I was only nine years old at that time. I got it. What about if you're 30 years old? What have you been doing since you were 20 years old? Now you wanna get into real estate? Invest in information. You don't have to pay for that information. And when this starts tipping, this goes down very quick with paranoia. That's where value is. That is where Warren Buffett is. Warren Buffett says this, when the tide goes out, you will see the one swimming naked. And the ones that swim naked don't have a stack. They don't have a savings account. And when markets adjust, the ones that have liquidity, I don't care if it's a hundred thousand dollars, 10,000, you're going to make money. But in between there, you can learn a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So learn, be patient and then stack and rack. Yep. Build that capital so that you can then yes, make sir. the move. Yeah, and that's stack and rack. You know, stack your money. And if you can't rack it in investment, rack it in information. Get knowledge. It's yes. like my granddaughter. She told you today, stack and rack. Yeah. She doesn't, she's four years <laughs> old. She says stack and rack. She runs around the house, stack and rack, stack and rack. <laughs> but we are embedded into her subconscious mind because she will understand what stack and rack means. Because guess what? It's our duty, my kids' duty, to make sure we compound our wealth for my grandbaby so they know what stack and rack means so they can compound it to their children and this theme becomes a legacy, a Castro legacy. I love that, beautiful. So the last question I have is, talk to me a little bit about three things, right? PMA, positive mental yep. attitude, how important coaching has been, it's been a recurring theme in your guys' life, yep. before, during, and even after you guys had that yep. exit as you go to the next level. Um, and then also, how important it is for you guys to not only have a positive mental attitude, uh, not only have coaches, but also, um, you know, the impact that that has had in your life with things like, you know, manifestation. I know you're talking about the secret. Yep. So uh, we, we love to manifest things and somehow it happens. And the only way it happens is having a positive mental attitude. We believe in it so much. And, and that company we just exited for a billion dollars, you walk in there today, 500 plus employees have that shirt on. It's so powerful that Sophie and I trademark positive mental attitude all day, every day. We trademark stack and rack. Your employees literally wear positive oh, yeah. mental attitude. Yeah. You go to, you go to, it's the best culture. If you do yeah. a Google search, it's one of the best places to work for in the US. Wow. Go to Fortune, Forbes, yeah. hit it all. Uh, we, we, in 2012, I was so honored to win their Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Wow. That, that, I didn't realize how big that was until years later. Like, who's Ernest and Young? I didn't even, <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't even know. Yeah, yeah. And we made Inc. Magazine 13 times. Wow. In 05, the fifth fastest growing company in America. Wow. And that all came from just this positive mental attitude. And that's how you build a culture and it becomes contagious. And was that culture built, I don't mean to interject, but was that culture built during, after the recession? Yes. So that's yes, when you sir. went intentional in the business. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and it, 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 it's been a game changer in our whole life. I mean, you'll see my family members walk around with PMA and the coaching. Um, it's a very sensitive topic. Um, there's a lot of coaches, a lot of resources that can, that is for you out there to take advantage of. But what you don't want to do is skip the process and do your due diligence on where you're going to dive yourself into information. Uh, make sure they have the results, massive results, not just results, massive. They've been through many cycles, many challenges personally, business-wise, that can actually give you value. Um, Sophie and I are getting tremendous value from some really great individuals that are helping us move the needle, thinking differently. Um, and um, it's important because I, I know for the first time ever, I've been exposed now for five months on social media. I never really, I never been on social media. It's overwhelming. There's, if I was a young person or even do like me at 52, it's a lot of information, man. Who do I hire? What do I do? I mean, there, and yeah. everyone's just so glued on a Ferrari, a Lambo, <laughs> jet, what, whatever yeah. it is, or, and which I can see it. It's very, it's, it's appealing. 
But there's, that is just so far out there. So many distractions. So yeah. if you're going to get a coach, get a coach that can help you at the stage where you're at. You don't need anything more than that because you're not there. Just go in stages, man. Don't try to premature pivot because it's unre- it doesn't relate to your situation. Yeah. You're, you're, you're paycheck to paycheck. You're constantly broke. You have $30,000 in credit card debt. That's a stage you need to put your efforts on. And, and, and there's no coach for that. We all know what to do in that case. Start being who you are. Stop overspending. Get out of credit card debt. I see a lot of beautiful people. Bobby, I'm saving. I, I, I have $50,000 in the bank account. I said, awesome. Rock and roll, man. Hey, you have any debt? Yeah, I got $20,000 in credit <laughs> card debt. Mm. Dude, you, you only got $30,000 in savings. You, you got to pay that debt off. It makes no sense. The, the, these simple things can teach you on Google. You know, you, you got to get out of debt before you stack because that's not a bona fide stack. We went in credit card debt for so many years, $100,000 at a time. We thought we were getting ahead. We'll never do it again. Never. Use that ATM, Sophie. <laughs> we got back on the crack. Yeah. We started leaning on them. Just, it, it, that, that was Every a time big we issue had a us. savings account, we thought we had a savings account. And then we're like, but wait a minute, we have $100,000 in credit card debt. What are we doing? We don't have, we need to pay and, this And August. you have good it intentions. Like, you think you're going to go out to the dinner? Oh, no, we'll yeah. pay. And it's, it's, it's gonna, just a dinner. It's going to fix our dinner, credit. Yeah. We can use it yeah, yeah. and show that we are allowed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. months and years go by doing that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then talk to me about manifestation and the law of attraction. Huge, huge. And the only way you can buy into that is dive into that without any distractions. And um, the, secret, the secret's been around for a bit. Every time you read the secret, you read it differently. You become more mature. You start buying into it. So um, law of attraction is huge, man. Um, it's so powerful. People ignore it. I, I, I've been speaking a lot. I don't know if young people are buying into my stuff because when they get through it, I know they're giving up on the book because it's getting kind of wacky for some. Sure. But they're so freaking focused on a Ferrari. If you're so focused on a Ferrari, that's not a book for you. But if you <laughs> want to become wealthy, you want to be a kind person, you want production in your life, I'm begging you, read this book. It's about this thick. Yeah. And I found this book many years ago from a beautiful person. Of course, I don't know her, but I'm a huge fan of hers. Oprah Winfrey. I can't I'm bad pronounce her name. It's Oprah. Yeah. And um, huge. Yeah. Yeah, you used to manifest things even from the since the beginning of our relationship. And I used to always tell him, but are you crazy? You, you know, you wanted to get here. We don't even have this. PMAs He's like, no, we thinking. are. We're going to get there. We're going to get this or, you know, whatever it was. It could have been a, a building or it could be, you know, we're going to reach this goal of money in our savings account or, or we're going to, you know, this company is going to take here. And I would but, like, but I want to make what? sure <laughs> some people don't get confused. You can manifest it and do what Bobby did and still does. No, we're going to do it. It's going to, Amazon's oh, going to yeah, deliver no. it. Yeah. It's going to come here. You got to actually yeah, yeah. do something action. about it too. You yeah. got to take action. Yeah. Take Bobby is action, a very yeah. focused person, like I always said, and takes action on everything he does. You know, so we lived so our life done like that. But. In an hour compared to most. I, I, I fit so much in my minute. That's why there's another uh, fundamental called urgent, massive action. The faster I give this effort um, value and immediate action, the faster I can get a result from it and I can move on. Just like when I ha- had meetings before my company, sometimes you can have an hour meeting, you can go on. There's no more than a 10 minute meeting. You're coming to meet your employees, your staff, because there's an issue. You're gonna have takeaways for the next meeting to bring the solutions back. It's really quickly 10 minutes. Yeah, what's our outcome? Yeah. How much can you get done in your hour, man? It's unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, so the last question we have is at the end of every interview, we always ask people, if you could look back and give the young Sophie, the young Bobby, their best advice to a young Bobby or young Sophie who was looking for answers, who was trying to find a way to make their life work, who was yeah. praying and hoping. And I'm sure you guys have had a lot of tough nights, whether you had money, ups and downs, yeah. crying, praying to God, trying to manifest your way out of holes. I swear I'll never do this yes. again. Yep. Uh, to people around the world, uh, men, women, entrepreneurs, people in jobs who are trying to make their life work, who are stuck, and they might see you guys like, oh, you, it's easy for you guys to say you're at where you're at. What would be your best advice to somebody out there looking for answers who's in that place and trying to figure out how to make their life work at any age? Yeah, Game changer for Bobby Castro. 
limit a lot of friends. I started spending more time with myself. It's a full-time job when you have a lot of people in your life. And that sucks, man. I don't mean that in a harsh way. Um, you're gonna have to release yourself. You're, you're, you're getting bogged down. You're get, and, and I'm gonna keep going back to distractions. Um, you're gonna, in a good way, these are beautiful people, man. They're family members, they're friends. There's people that you knew from elementary. That's my boy <laughs> and all that. You're gonna have to say, man, high five, dude. I'm 25 years old, man. I, I gotta do something. You know, I'm gonna be checked out for a while. And I just want to let you know, I love you and all that, but I'm a friggin' mess. What do, you, what do you mean, Bob? You're doing good, man. You got a great job. No, man, it's not where I want to be. I want more. And when you have that internal conversation with yourself and you are ready to have that conversation with your entire crew, you will find out what happens. You become lonely and nobody likes to be lonely. No one's around and we don't lie to ourselves. We can lie to others, they can lie to us, but when we're by ourselves and you're taking that warm shower, that's where you wanna be. Yeah. That's my advice, dude. It, it, it's been a game changer. I am a lot of energy. I can easily get distracted, easily, but I am aware of my weakness. I'm aware of it. Yeah, I would say that um, stay focused, get a lot of knowledge of where you wanna go. You got to have a final goal. You have to know where you wanna be in life. And it could be many things. You could be wanting to, like I said, you wanna be a stay home mom, or if you wanna be in a career, or if you wanna be an entrepreneur, but have a goal and be focused at it and get a lot of knowledge of where you want that industry that you wanna be in. Um, I learned that in the hard way. Um, I'm one that was very distracted by friends and not really wanting to be focused because I, I want, I, you know, I wanted to be everywhere. I wanted to do many things all at once, and um, I realized that that doesn't work. And Bobby kept on telling me, "You're just being too distracted, and um, you just, you know, see a squirrel and you want to be squirrel." And <laughs> um, I learned that it, you know, and I fought him for many years on this. But after really bending into it and really know doing it, and I realized, my God, if I would have done this a long time ago. I would have been so much further, not, not, I'm not saying now, I'm talking about, you know, before, I would have been so much further in my, you know, where we want to go. Um, so I would say stay focused, get a lot of knowledge and have a goal. And, and one thing I really want to squeeze in if I can, Omar, seven out of 10, 10 of us go to work and we hate our job. Start falling in love with your job. That's the stage you're at. Start falling in love with it. That will pivot you. That will lead you to better. Um, you got to get in the habit of falling in love with the process. Yes, I don't like to be a secretary. I don't like to be a housekeeper at Holiday Inn. Fall in love with this process. Start buying into the process. You will start growing. You will start having a better mindset. You will start manifesting better things in your life. Um, so um, watch, you know, be very careful, man. It's, it's so dangerous, man. You got to fall in love with the process of growing. You're only here, you're a housekeeper because you're right here at this moment in time. Doesn't mean you're gonna be there next year. Yeah, and time flies just like that. Very quickly, sure, dude. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure you can still remember the times when you started early on in your like career. Yesterday, man, like yesterday, man. Remember my, my, my daughter, she's 28 years old, gonna be 29, that was my baby. Yeah. I see my grandbaby, Ocean, I see Priscilla. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm 19, I'm 52. I have more energy than, than these 19 year olds. <laughs> I, 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 what do you mean I'm 52? Yeah, it's beautiful. Now, at the end of every interview, we play a game called First Things First. Um, so I'll play with both of you guys. We'll go with Sophie and then uh, you, Bobby, and then we'll wrap up the interview. Basically, the way the game works is it's just a word relation game. So I'm going to rifle off a word or phrase, and you just tell me the first word or phrase that comes to mind. Cool, Like I a love quick that. relation game. So just the first word or phrase that comes to mind. So oh, we we'll do go. that a lot. <laughs> yeah. So we'll go first with you. So putting up with Bobby Castro. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wow is the word. Yeah. Um, putting up with Bobby Castro, it's a, a difficult ride because yeah. of his personality that I told you to be, uh? Well, one word, but, one word. Oh, one word. First word or phrase, yeah. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that says it all, yeah. Okay, second thing, uh, real, the opportunity in real estate. Great, love it. <laughs> the day the wire transfer cleared. Very emotional. Um, your biggest regret uh, looking back. Not being focused at the very beginning or getting enough knowledge. Your best advice on raising kids, um, you know, when you have wealth. Being very uh, honest with them and, and making them know 
um, what your final goals are for them too. Uh, looking back at where you guys came from. Oh my God, um, incredible. Because I can't believe we were there and now where we're at. Yeah, uh, best decision you ever made. Marrying Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Set you up for that one. Huh? <laughs> Uh, worst advice you've ever received? Oh, wow, that one's a difficult one. Um, probably jumping at opportunities without uh, getting advice to do something without getting knowledge. Best advice you've ever received? Uh, to have focusness, <laughs> which was from Bobby. <laughs> yeah. And then the last one is uh, the Castro legacy as you see it. Yeah. I want something to be big. I want it to be something that's going to be amazing, that everybody's going to know about it, that they're going to be, wow, that was an awesome family. Dynamic, wow. That's Dyna beautiful. Dynamic, I you want it to awesome, be. You guys are awesome, man. All right, Bobby, you ready? Yes, sir. All right, first one, freedom. Scale. Money. Freedom. Your biggest insecurities? Myself. Worst advice you've ever received? Trust me. <laughs> Best advice you've ever received? Trust yourself. Biggest regret you have in business? I should have done more due diligence on a lot of things. Um, coaching, mentorship? Careful. Knowledge? Priceless. Real estate? Wealth. And then the last one is the Castro legacy as you see it. Ecstasy. I love it. Beautiful. Well, thank you guys so thank much you, for being the start of the show. It's been a, pleasure, it's been a real it's pleasure. Been awesome. Thank you guys for tuning into this episode and make sure to follow Bobby and Sophia on Instagram and social media. Till next time, live strong, live with passion. We'll see you guys then. If you guys enjoyed that video, be sure to